Um, I'm Steve Weiss. I'm the curator of the Southern Folklife Collection here at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill Libraries. And uh, I want to welcome you to tonight's program, uh, Women of Early Blues Guitar with Valerie Turner and Piedmont Blues Acoustic Duo. Uh, this program was made possible through the support of the Martin Guitar Company. In addition to thanking them, I want to thank UNC Libraries, Shaw Lentz, Katie Finfani, Ilya, uh, Ilya pa, um, <laughs> Howe, Leah Stanley, Liz Ott, and Maria Estorino for their support. <clears throat> the, uh, the video excerpt that preceded our program um, was from the 1989 documentary Step It Up and Go by Susan Massengale and Glenn Hinson and features uh, the great North Carolina guitarist Etta Baker of Caldwell County. Etta is one of five women blues artists whose music will be discussed and performed tonight. And we'll be taking questions at the end of the program. So please feel free to, to add your questions to the chat. So it's my honor to introduce tonight's guests. Uh, Valerie and her husband, Benedict Turner, perform as Piedmont Blues Acoustic Duo, and they're dedicated preservationists of the Piedmont uh, style of music traditions, and they perform at venues and festivals across the United States and have traveled as far as Europe and the Middle East to share their music. The, they are 2018 inductees into the New York Blues Hall of Fame. Valerie Turner is a native New Yorker with roots in Virginia and Georgia who specializes in Piedmont style finger picking and she's taught guitar workshops, including the Port Townsend Acoustic Blues Workshop, Augusta Heritage Senators, uh, Center's Blues Week, and Blues in the Gorge. She is co-president of the Mississippi John Hurt Foundation and the author of Piedmont Style Country Blues Guitar Basics. Her repertoire is heavily influenced by years spent studying with John Cephas and Woody Mann, two great musicians and teachers who are dearly missed in the roots music community. Benedict Turner is a roots percussionist who specializes in lap style washboard, and you'll also hear him on Bones and Heart. Uh, as a professional graphic designer and a senior art director, Benedict uses vintage washboards and bells from around the world, creating his unique line of Darlington washboards. And Benedict has studied with Washboard Chaz of Louisiana, as well as Newman Taylor Baker of the Ebony Hillbillies. Inspired by these two talented percussionists, Benedict has his own style of washboard playing, which is influenced by the melodic and percussive sounds of the steel drums of his birthplace, Trinidad and Tobago. So please join me in welcoming them. Well, good evening. Um, I'm Valerie Turner. This is my husband, Benedict Turner, and we thank the Southern Folklife Collection for having us. We play country blues, an early form of acoustic blues that originates in the African-American community. It's the music of our grandparents, and we're pleased to have this opportunity to share some of our heritage with you. Um, this evening, our presentation focuses on some of the women that contributed to early blues guitar. I'll give a bit of background for each artist I've selected, and with Benedict, who will accompany me on percussion and harmonica, will also play some of their music for you. I'll be using a variety of guitars this evening, starting with this resonator. It's a custom-made instrument created by Ron Phillips of California, and its small size makes it unique among resonator guitars. Beneath this circular plate here, this type of guitar has a cone that acts as an amplifier, making it louder than non-resophonic guitars. And speaking of female guitar players, I believe that this model was designed for Del Rey. Um, as we move along, I'll describe my other guitars. I have a whole bunch of them here. And Benedict will also tell you about some of the instruments he's playing this evening. So let's begin with a bit of background on blues music. 
female vocalists like Ma Rainey, Bessie Smith, and Ethel Waters made it popular during the 1920s. However, the genre was soon dominated by men with guitars, and this became an enduring symbol of blues music. Although this presentation focuses on women who played blues guitar, I feel that we should play, we should pay homage to um, at least one of the fabulous female vocalists who impacted blues music. There are so many to choose from, and I've selected Gertrude Pridget, who you might know as Ma Rainey. There's confusion as to whether Ma Rainey was born in Alabama in 1882 or Georgia in 1886, but census data leans towards Alabama. In any case, she began her singing career as a teenager after performing at a talent show and early exposure to the minstrel and vaudeville traditions influenced her performance style. Um, a flashy stage presence, strong vocal skills, and songwriting ability combined to propel Rainey to the top of the blues genre. She created what is now considered classic blues and is best remembered as the mother of the blues. Rainey's contributions have been recognized by um, the Blues Foundation's Hall of Fame, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, the Grammy Hall of Fame, and the Library of Congress. Also, the United States Post Office issued a commemorative postage stamp in her honor. Now, one song made famous by Ma Rainey is a traditional piece called C.C. Rider. C.C. stands for County Circuit, and a County Circuit Rider was someone like a preacher that traveled by horseback or horse and buggy over an assigned circuit in a particular county. And as they followed their routes, these men often had a different girlfriend at each stopover. The song C.C. Rider was first recorded by Ma Rainey in 1924. And since then, it's been covered by blues artists like Big Bill Brunzi, Mississippi John Hurt, and Lightning Hopkins. So here's how we play it.
hate me looking at my man's instrument am I playing? This is a common household washboard that your grandmother or your great-grandmother may have used for washing clothing. Washboards were also used as percussion instruments. By tapping on different areas, uh, it gives you a variety of sounds. Um, because I'm an artist, I've been able to create unusual washboards by incorporating interesting bells and carvings. My washboards can be used as instruments and can also be used as art. Well, um, moving right along, our next artist is Elizabeth Cotton. She was a folk and blues musician from North Carolina, born in 1893. As a child, Elizabeth was fascinated by her brother's banjo and enjoyed playing it when he wasn't around. However, once she discovered guitars, Elizabeth fell in love with them. And while saving enough money to buy her first guitar, which was a small Stella, she taught herself to play on guitars that she borrowed from other people. One problem with the borrowed guitars was that they were strung for right-handed musicians, so she ended up holding her guitar in the opposite direction with the strings upside down and developed a style of finger picking with a unique quality. Her finger picking style falls into the category of Piedmont style finger picking, which is my specialty. It's characterized by an alternating bass played by the thumb while the other fingers of the picking hand add a syncopated melody, making it sound like two guitars are being played at once. And if you watch my right hand closely, you'll see a great example of that in most of what we play for you this evening. Some other things to mention about Elizabeth Cotton are that she was a Grammy Award winner, a National Heritage Fellow, and earlier this year, she was even inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Um, while her induction into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame may seem strange, it was actually appropriate. Like jazz, rock and roll derived from blues music, and numerous rock and roll musicians were inspired by early folk and blues musicians such as Elizabeth Cotton. So, we're going to play a medley of Elizabeth Cotton's music, including um, Wilson Rag, Oh Babe It Ain't No Lie, and Freight Train. Freight Train is a song that Elizabeth Cotton composed when she was just a little girl, and it's the song that she's best known for. It was very popular during the folk revival of the 1960s, and you'll find a version of it in the repertoires of many folk and blues musicians. I've rewritten some of the lyrics to suit myself. This is known as the folk process or the process by which songs evolve from one generation to another. And for this medley, I'm using a very special model of Martin guitar, which was designed to honor Elizabeth Cotton. It's decorated with a small freight train at the 12th fret, I don't know if you can see it, but there's a freight train here. And um, further up the neck, we find um, Elizabeth Cotton's name. I don't think this is her handwriting. I believe one of her grandchildren may have created the signature for this guitar project. This uh, model guitar is, uh, it, it was a very limited edition. Only 76 exist in the world. 76 were made, and this one is number 
44. So um, here's our version of Freight Train. Mm -hmm. Song about it, and this is it. It's called 
obeyed, it ain't no lie. There's one old woman, Lord, in this town. She keeps on telling her old lies on me. I wish to my soul that old woman, she would die. She keeps on telling her own lies on me. Oh, baby, it ain't no lie. by um, artists for whom we have little information and few recordings because it always makes me wonder what else did they play what else could we be missing and um, one such artist is a musician known as Lily Mae Wiley whom some of you may know as Geishi Wiley very little is known about Geishi Wiley no one can confirm her birth date, her birthplace, or even her name. We know that along with her music partner, L.V. Thomas, Geishi Wiley recorded a half dozen records between 1930 and 1931 for Paramount Records at their studio in Grafton, Wisconsin. The songs Geishi Wiley and L.V. Thomas recorded are considered pre-war masterpieces of American music. One of those songs is called Eagles on a Half. And in case you didn't know, the song title refers to the eagle stamped on the back side of our half dollar coin. So here's Geishi Wiley's song, Eagles on a Half. Thank you. 
special one yeah <laughs> so we have another song for you by Gishi Wiley and it's one of my favorites the song is called last kind words and I think this is her best piece stylistically I would categorize it as pre blues music but the timing of its recording between 1930 and 1931 solidly positions it in the heyday of early blues music. For this piece, I'll be playing a very special instrument. It's an old Stella circa 1929. It's the kind of instrument that some early blues musicians played, and I love the sound of it for this particular song. Mm. that's bothering me. And if I 
if I don't bring you flowers, I will bring you bolted meals. Well, I went to the devil and looked up at the stars. I cried, that train don't come, there'll be some walking done. Now my mama, she told me, just before she died Lord, my precious daughter Don't you be so wild Well, the Mississippi River You know it's deep and wide I, I can stand right here, see my babe on the other side. What you do to me, babe, it never gets out of me. I, I may not see. Across the deep blue sea Lord, the last kind words I heard my daddy say. Well, if you want to know more about Geishi Wiley and L.V. Thomas, I recommend reading the comprehensive article titled the Ballad of Gishi and Elvi by John Jeremiah Sullivan, published in the New York Times Magazine in 2014. It's a very long article, but um, it's well worth reading. I've read it a couple of times myself. Now, back to my favorite guitar here. <laughs> Um, okay, so another early blues artist from North Carolina is Etta Baker. She played banjo and guitar, which she learned from her father, Boone Reed. Like Elizabeth Cotton, Etta Baker played in the Piedmont finger-picking style. Her earliest performances were at local events where her father and sister Cora joined her through field recordings captured by folklorist Paul Clayton, Etta Baker's music found broader recognition when her music was included on an album called Instrumental Music of the Southern Appalachians. One thing you should know about Etta Baker is that she is designated as a National Heritage Fellow, and that's the highest honor that a traditional artist can receive in the United States. Although Etta Baker never achieved the same notoriety as similar artists of her era, she was well respected by other great Piedmont-style musicians of her region, 
including John Jackson and my mentor, John Cephas. Etta Baker is best remembered for the song One Dime Blues, a composition by Lemon Henry Jefferson, also known as Blind Lemon Jefferson. He's often referred to as the father of Texas blues. So here's our interpretation of One Dime Blues. tells the legend of a man in southern Alabama named Morris Slater, who was known to rob food trains and then give all of his loot to the poor. Private detectives, lawmen, and railroad officials all tried to catch him, and there was a huge bounty for his capture, but Railroad Bill managed to evade them all for quite some time. His luck ran out in Atmore, Alabama, where he was eventually shot and killed in 1896. Some believe that his spirit haunts the railroad tracks leading out of northern Florida into southern Alabama. In any case, his legend lives on in the many songs written about him. I've changed some of the lyrics and added a few of my own, and I hope you enjoy our version of Railroad Bill inspired by the playing of Etta Baker and John Jackson. Here you are. Thank you. 
Louisville, sitting on that hill. Never work, no eat, never will. Living right over railroad. Memphis Mini, and this is the last artist that we'll present this evening. Memphis Mini was born in Algiers, Louisiana in 1897. She was raised in Memphis and learned both guitar and banjo by age 11. Using her childhood nickname, Kid Douglas, she toured the southern states of the U.S. starting in 1916 and returned to Memphis in the late 1920s as Memphis Minnie, a name created by Columbia Records. Memphis Minnie was married three times. Her first husband was guitarist Will Weldon, whom she married in the early 1920s. Her second husband was guitarist and mandolin player Joe McCoy, also known as Kansas Joe McCoy, 
and they married in 1929. Um, and around 1938, she married guitarist and singer Ernest Lawlers, also known as Little Son Joe. Memphis Minnie is remembered as her generation's leading female blues guitarist, and I would add that her music contributions rivaled those of anyone regardless of gender. An accomplished guitarist and gifted songwriter, she recorded more than 150 sides between 1929 and 1941. Most were solo pieces, but she also teamed up for duets with her second husband, Kansas Joe McCoy, and her third husband, Little Son Joe. Memphis Minnie was forced to give up singing and playing after a stroke in 1962, and she died in 1973. She's one of our favorite early blues musicians, and we have a few of her songs to share with you. The first one is called Drunken Barrel House. A barrel house um, was a place where people could gather to socialize and whiskey was served straight from the barrel. For the next song, I'll be accompanying Valerie on a percussion instrument called bones. Bones were originally made from the rib bone of a large animal, such as a cow or a bison. These days, bones are also made from wood, slate, and different types of metals. You can create different rhythms by placing them in between your fingers, and with the flick of the wrist, you can create interesting sounds. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> so here's Drunken Barrel House. One moment. Ready? Yes, I okay. am. <laughs> Thank you. 
takes a drink of Washington, D.C. by the name of John Cephas. He was the guitar playing half of the famed Cephas and Wiggins duo. As a mentor, John was very thorough in everything he taught me. And one song that I learned from him is called Black Rat Swing. The song was composed by Memphis Minnie's third husband, Ernest Lawlers. It's a piece that Memphis Minnie is known for and it's one of our favorite pieces to play. Can I hear your heart? <laughs>
many blues songs were played in various tunings, and uh, rather than spend time changing the tuning of this guitar, I'll just grab one that already has the tuning that I need. Okay. As, ooh, do I have enough room here? Yes, you do. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, as you can see, this is uh, another resonator guitar. This one was manufactured by National Guitars, one of the leading makers of resophonic guitars. It's a bit larger and much heavier than the Ron Phillips that I've been playing. So blues songs capture every human emotion and experience. And these early blues songs often captured history. This next song is one such piece. It tells the story of a great flood that occurred in 1927 when the Mississippi River flooded after its levees failed. At that time, it was the most destructive river flood in the history of the United States, reaching a depth of 30 feet and killing hundreds of people across seven states. Most of the people affected lived in Arkansas, Mississippi, and Louisiana. The song, When the Levee Breaks, composed by Memphis Minnie and Kansas Joe McCoy is about that flood, will play this last song for you, and we thank you for sharing part of your evening thank with you. us. <laughs> now let's see, let's get this in the right key. change that a little bit. Okay. When the levee breaks.
I thank you so much, Valerie and Ben. Um, that was a really wonderful, warm performance. Um, starting to get chilly, and that really hit the spot uh, for for me at least. And I and, a, and according to a number of of our comments, um, a couple of which I'd like to relay and echo. Um, I think I think all our attendees enjoyed it. Um, one said, Valerie and Ben, I'm enjoying this concert so much. It is really great to see and hear you guys. Um, and another attendee said she used to have uh, concerts in her home in Nazareth, Pennsylvania, and you performed there. Uh, she's now in Austin, Texas. And so this was truly special for her to be able to tune I know in. who that is. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and I think that's just, you know, if we look to any positives of the last couple of years, it's you know, the increase in a number of these virtual events that make them a lot more accessible to people all over the world. Um, so thank you very, very much for for the performance. Um, Welcome. Before we get to a couple of questions, if you have time, uh, I think we're gonna share in the comments a link to the video of which you saw a clip at the beginning um, that unfortunately didn't have audio, um, but it was a clip from the documentary, Step It Up and Go, as Steve mentioned. Um, it's available in full at the folkstreams.net uh, site. And the Southern Folk Life Collection holds the collection of folkstreams.net, um, which is a really wonderful, rich resources of documentaries of all types of folk traditions from not just music, but art, um, herbalism, hollering. Um, and so there are a lot of great uh, documentaries that are, are free to see. And if you're interested in researching those, you can get in touch with us um, at the Southern Folklife Collection and uh, the University of North Carolina. Um, I'd like to start out uh, with a question that we, that we had this just kind of uh, general and wondering um, what, what we can do to bring greater recognition to these amazing female artists um, who deserve more recognition than they've received throughout the years. Well, I think that programs like the one this evening are really good at um, highlighting the importance of the contributions that these women made. And um, we're so pleased to be uh, invited to, to do this. Um, I wish that there were more comprehensive events like this one, sometimes you'll have, um, you'll have an opportunity to play a few songs and say a few things in the middle of an overall concert that's really about more of a variety of artists, um, of, you know, including male artists is what I meant to say. Um, but having something that's just dedicated to this one topic is is really good. Yeah, um, and we had another question kind of along those lines, but of these early women country blues 
artists, however you want to refer to them. Is there one that that you most identify with? And I would say two are my favorite to play. One being Memphis Minnie. I think um, her music is just, it's so energetic and it resonates with a lot of people. Most women gra that play this type of music gravitate toward Memphis Minnie. Um, I, I like them all actually, um, but I would also say Elizabeth Cotton is a strong favorite of mine because um, my style of playing is very similar to, to hers. But I absolutely love all, all of the others that we presented tonight. Is there anyone who, who you didn't present that you'd like to um, put a spotlight on in particular? Well, um, sure, there are people that I, I can mention. I don't play their music, but there are people like uh, Flora Moulton from Virginia. Um, she was um, known for being a street singer and playing bottleneck slide. She did um, uh, gospel and blues music. There was also uh, Sister Rosetta Tharp. Um, her music appealed to both um, rhythm and blues and rock and roll audiences. Um, I think she was important. And of course, Big Mama Thor Thornton, um, she was known for her vocals, harmonica, drums, rhythm and blues. I think Hound Dog was her biggest hit, and that's a fun song to play. Um, I could also mention Aljamae Hinton, from North Carolina. She was unusual in that she um, she danced, she did buck dancing while she was playing her guitar <laughs> behind her back. Like, I, I don't know, I, I don't know how you do that. You know, kudos to her. Um, then there's um, Jessie Mae Hemphill of Mississippi. Of course, she played Hill Country Blues, which I love. I don't play any of that yet. Uh, she played a lot of instruments, um, bass, snare drum, diddly bow, quills, piano, five. the question is what didn't she play? Um, and then I could also add Precious Bryant, a lot of people like Precious Bryant, she was from Georgia, and um, that's, all that, that's all that comes to mind right now. Those, those are great, plenty of um, ideas to research further too with those, I know I'm gonna look up more of Gishi Wiley. Um, She's fascinating. Yeah, we had a we had a question um, about about your process. It's curious to hear hear you both talk about your process for learning repertoire and and working it up, arranging it as a duo. Go ahead. Oh, I'm answering. You're okay. answering. Um, <laughs> my process is always. <clears throat> I'll hear a song that catches my ear and it becomes like an earworm and I can't stop listening to it. And once it's in my head, then I'm able to figure it out. Um, I don't read music really, so I play by ear. So I have to hear something and I have to like it. If I hear it and I like it, then I will eventually play that song. I'll start by playing, trying to play what I'm hearing, exactly what I'm hearing. And then I just start to change it because I usually, like there could be a spot that I can't figure out or something that is, seems too tricky or um, uh, maybe I, I just want to inject something of my own in there. And so I'll change that spot. And then one spot turns into two spots, which turns into three spots. <laughs> and then before you know it, it's like the whole song is like a whole new spot. Um, so yeah. and that, that's my process. Yeah. And for me, what I do is I, I'm usually in, in my office space and Valerie's trying something out in, in her music room and and I hear it and I say to myself, what can I do to add a little something to this piece without overwhelming it? You know, usually washboard is, is a very loud instrument and played in a very brash way sometimes. Um, so I try to do it tastefully that will complement Valerie's 
uh, playing. Yeah, I'd, I'd say you, you both were successful in that. Um, and I think you mentioned earlier and highlighted, I think it's kind of really in the spirit of the folk tradition to hear your own interpretations and, and takes on these, these songs that have been kind of passed down. Um, we had a question about how you balance practicing and playing and, and kind of the historical research part of, of learning these songs and then performing them. Well, um, I think I had mentioned that, you know, a lot of these songs do carry a bit of history with them. And so it's always fun for us to, um, to, to look into where, you know, what, what, what time frame did the song come about in? Is the song talking about something special? Um, is there something special about the artist? Um, th th there's always something, there's always some backstory for every song and it's a, so much fun to dig in and research. And sometimes I'm really surprised by the things that I find. Like, um, for example, the song Casey Jones is a recent earworm of mine and I'm starting to, to play that one like a lot. And I didn't realize that that was a real person. You know, and there's a whole story, the whole true story. And I, I love it when there's a true story. I play a lot of murder ballads. <laughs> and I don't know if there's anyone out there from St. Louis, Missouri, <laughs> but all the murder ballads seem to take place there. And I'm just fascinated by by that in and of itself. I, I, I want to do a whole set one day of just murder ballads <laughs> because I have like this many of them. <laughs> Yeah, I'd, I'd be interested in hearing that. I'd definitely tune in. Um, no, those are like my favorite ones to play. <laughs> uh, you had mentioned Memphis many earlier, and there was a question here that if you happen to know if um, among her husbands, did she divorce all of them or was she widowed? Um, I think she was divorced from her first one. You know, I don't know. I don't know. Now I, I'm obsessed. I have yeah. to find out. <laughs> Could be some um, some spicy history there. Maybe she um, murdered them. <laughs> to combine the murder Maybe there's ballads. There's a ballad there. Yeah. I don't. That did Wrong not. idea. <laughs> um, someone had a question, or several folks wondered about a lyric, um, and I. I can't say that I picked this out, but I'm going to hide my shoes somewhere down near your coattail. And if you. Yeah, that's in Black Rat Swing. I'm going to hide my shoes somewhere near your coattail or your shirt tail. I don't know why they wrote that. <laughs> I don't know. I learned that song from John Cephas. He taught that to me. I don't know what he meant by that. <laughs> um. Can't ask him. He's gone. <laughs> And, you know, sometimes you, you don't need to know the meaning. You can attach your own to it and just go with the spirit. Well, sometimes um, I think people dig too deeply into lyrics because sometimes it's just there because it fit and it felt good to sing it. And there's, there's no deep, dark meaning, usually. Right. Um, Definitely. Another question uh, we had was is about uh, Elizabeth Cotton tune Delia. If you know if you know that one and anything about the background of that tune, that's not her song. Um, I think that's um, Reverend Gary Davis's song Delia, and that's a murder ballad, and it's a true story, and it tells the story of uh, a young couple that uh, got into a horrible argument and um, Delia ended up being murdered. And it's interesting that you ask about that one. I completely rewrote that song um, from a different viewpoint. And I used to perform it and then I suddenly stopped. And Ben keeps asking me to bring it back. And now that you asked about it, I might 
consider it. Yeah, but, asked but, you very recently yeah, about that song. Yeah, I have I have my own it. version of it. Um, I tell the story from from the murderer's perspective. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's well, a very sad song. <laughs> I'm glad uh, you know one of our attendees' questions might inspire you as as your performance tonight uh hopefully did them um into listening to more of this music um and, and getting it out there for a number of people who would hear it especially from you know these these kind of forgotten underrepresented women blues artists um it's just exciting to hear and learn more about and I just want to thank you both for joining us. Um, thank you all to uh, who tuned in for tuning in. And I'm going to throw it back to Steve to close us out. Great. Yeah. Thanks so much, Shaw. And you know, again, our, our special thanks to to Valerie and Benedict for tonight's performance. That was really wonderful. And I want to thank our audience for joining us. Um, and thank you all. And have a have a great night. Thank, Thank you. you.